Welcome back, everybody. Of course, those of us who are professors who talk about empty words do it with as many words as we possibly can <laughs> use. So the, we are never uh, lacking in words. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do for a number of the lectures that are coming up is to take some issues in which the application of emptiness needs to be explored, or so I think. Because for the Buddhist, it's really crucial that we never find ourselves in a situation where there is a single place that emptiness disappears and permanence and essence appears. Because if it springs up anywhere, it's everywhere. So they had to take on every single issue and ask the question, is this one also empty? And is this one? And this one? And it's a kind of an endless thing. So people say, how can you give eight lectures on emptiness? And I say, if you really go at it, we could go on and on for a whole year. And we'd <laughs> never cover all the possibilities of things that might not be empty. And words is one of the important issues. Uh, we, we live with words all the time. So I want to take you on a little bit of a journey in terms of thinking about words and what we can do with them. One of the things that we have in philosophy, which a lot of people are not so aware of, is that if you have it is understood, if you have multiple uses of a word, <coughs> then the word itself is meaningless. That's a given law in philosophy. So if I say to you suddenly, Washington, you're waiting, right? It has no meaning. You don't know which one I mean. Do I mean Seattle? Aha, huh, another word. Once I get that other word, I know precisely. All right, I've got it. Washington State. D.C. Oh, you mean the capital. George. Oh, you mean the name of George Washington, the first president. But the word itself, and I just give it to you, since it has multiple meanings, it has no meaning until it's identified as specifically which one of the meanings am I going to use for it this time. So we have to keep that in mind, that when we have multiplicity, it's very hard then to attribute any kind of meaning. I have to admit to one of my hobbies, I love crossword puzzles. And I do them all the time, and that's what I love to do after breakfast is to do the New York Times crossword puzzle. But as you may know, the New York Times has this thing that it gets harder every day of the week. Monday, you feel like you're the smartest person on earth because you race through the puzzle in about 10 minutes. Tuesday, it slows you down a little bit. Wednesday, it's getting really hard. Thursday, sometimes you get part of it, but not all of it. By Saturday, forget it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who can do it. It's so hard. However, it's one of my dreams that someday I might actually be able to do the Saturday puzzle, but I doubt I ever will. I decided to take us backwards. Instead of doing a puzzle where you have all the blanks and they give you some clues and then you fill in the letters. Let's start with one that's already filled in. There is a word in this that means to hide something to deceive, the birthplace of an automobile, and a springtime activity. Can you spot a word that could be the answer to any of those clues. Wow. 
I'll help you a little. Plant. It was plant. Plant as such has no meaning. The word. It has multiple meanings. So therefore, if I say plant, you might think I mean, oh, you're going to plant something in the ground. But you don't know for sure that that's what I mean by it, because it has multiple meanings. Do I mean a manufacturing plant where people make things? I'm going to the plant. Or do I say, ah, they planted the evidence on that person. <laughs> they deceived by planting something. So therefore, because the word has multiple meanings, in and of itself, it's meaningless. It is empty of a meaning because it has multiple meanings. And that's what is constantly one of the things that people say, why do you like to do the crossword puzzle? And I say, the reason I like to do it because it makes you a good Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> and why does it make you a good Buddhist? It makes you a good Buddhist because if you can't give up your attachment to an idea that you have when you read the clue and can't think of what word to put in, and you're really clinging to an idea they mean that this is an automobile something or other, and you just can't let go of it, you'll never solve the puzzle. You have to be detached from your idea. You have to finally come up and say, oh, it's nothing to do with automobiles. I have to give up that, that dream that that's what the word is. It has to do with planting something in the ground. So, it teaches me detachment. I have to detach from my, my first absolute assurance that it must be this meaning. And it's the puzzle that forces me to say, no, that's not what they mean. The meaning is not yet there. I've, I haven't gotten it because I've been attached to the wrong idea about it, so consequently, I can't solve the puzzle. I know that a plant is one that only people who play snooker would know. A snooker shot where one red ball hits another red ball that moves on to hit a third is called a plant. <laughs> only a snooker person would even know what it means. That's just to indicate when you've got multiple meanings for a word, it can keep on going and going. People can redo the word entirely. Why? Words only have meaning because we attribute them. We decide that a certain sound, we will all agree, has meaning one, meaning two, meaning three, meaning four. It's just convention. Now, when the Buddha said that, they were, for, they were against one big movement in India which said, no, no, no. Sound actually depicts the thing itself. The Mimamsa group was determined to say, when you make the right sound, it's a universal sound, and that sound actually is the thing itself. They had a whole different feeling about it. And this is partly where mantras come from. The sound is really crucial. If you get the sound right, it's not just convention, it's really magical. It works. So you need to have exactly the right sound because it, it is not empty. The Buddhist in general said, yes, sound is empty. Sound, we just give appropriations to. However, as time went by, there were, of course, as you'll find in Buddhism all the time, other people who said, yes, but with the mantra, it has me. It has its own meaning in the sound itself. But other Buddhists began to worry very much 
uh-oh, this sounds like you're creeping over into saying that something has an essence. And if that's so, then before you know it, you're going to have a self. You're going to have destroyed the entire Buddhist fabric if you find even one thing in which the thing itself and the essence can be identified as permanent and holding on to it. So, when I looked up plant, I have to say that I found out something i would never heard before, maybe you have, that plant means heavy machinery. Has anybody ever heard that? <laughs> yeah. It's, it is used, and it's, it's well attested. So that was a meaning which I never had known before. Um, I ran into a, a, an expression in a book I was reading recently. Bob's your uncle. And I thought, what in the world do they mean when it's, it was in dialogue and they said something to somebody and the person answered in obviously a slang expression, ah, Bob's your uncle. I said to my wife, I've never heard this expression, Bob's your uncle. She said, oh, sure. It means everything's okay. Everything's done. <laughs> Bob's your uncle means it's, it's finished, it's done. I don't know where she found that out, I kept saying, how did you know that? <laughs> I never heard it in my life. So of course I went to Google, and Google says that's what it means, but they also say nobody knows where it comes from. They can't explain exactly why that has that meaning, but by convention people have accepted. If somebody comes to you and says, is the car all packed up? You say, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you now to have a new word and a new expression so that you can talk about something which is fully done and ready. But you can see how meaning is convention. And if you don't know the meaning, like I didn't know the meaning of heavy machinery, somebody could say plant to me all day long, and I would misinterpret every single time they say it. I'm taking the plant down to the crossroads where I'm going to use the plant to tear up the pavement and I'm going, I wouldn't know what they're talking about. Plant has a lot of things. Uh, you plant to kiss. That means you give. <coughs> but you plant a colony. So when people came across the Atlantic and formed the colony, they said, they came over to plant it, to set it up. So we began to see that this word, talk about multiple meanings, it has an ex expanded multiple meanings. And there are many times where we may come into contact with one of those, but it doesn't, it's not in our convention. We haven't joined the conventional agreement that this is one of its meanings. And none of those meanings can occur unless you give something else. You have to, when you say plant a kiss, it's the companion word that tells you what it means. You almost always have to have those companion words because in and of itself, the word has no meaning. I did this one because of what we have over here with poor Glenn. The cabling, which is inside a premise, is a plant. It's called inside plant, ISP. All of this spaghetti that he has over here, all of his cords and things, that's ISP. It's an inside plant. Did you know you had an inside plant? Uh, inside something. <laughs> plant also says, give a new idea. I'm just trying to show you when we talk and say, words with multiple meanings are meaningless. In and of themselves, they are meaningless. They are empty of a meaning till we infuse the meaning 
by something else. They have to stand together with something because if they don't stand with something, they can't stand by themselves and give you any meaning. So we have a lot of issues about the meaning of words. Can we have a meaning that is not what we think about meaning? Does meaning occur in a fashion that we think, or do words have many meanings or hidden subscripts? What we think about a word may not be the way it's being used. The word itself, like Pops your uncle, that's got a hidden subscript that I never knew before. So it, it does, there's no meaning for me. I'm reading it and trying to understand. Now sometimes in context, you can get it. When I was a child, I loved to read. And there, there were times when I would go through all of my books that I liked to read, and there was nothing else in the house. So I would go to my uncle's study where he had all of his college books, and he had the novels he'd read. So I'd pull them off his shelf because I was desperate and I'd start reading things that were far beyond anything I could really understand. And I would struggle to try to figure out what this was all about. What did that word mean? And, and in that struggle to understand when I was reading something which was far beyond my ability, but at least with words, and I could sound them out, sometimes wrongly, <laughs> We've never heard a word pronounced, and you just see it spelled with English, you know, that you don't always pronounce it correctly. Uh, it, it's these hidden subscripts, and I was trying to find that out as a child, and I failed very often. I just didn't get it. So in later years, when I went back and read the same books, I realized I didn't know what I was reading, but it was reading, so I read. I think that's called obsession. So what does this have to say for, for the Buddhist? The problem with words has to do with the mental state that is associated with that word. When we say a word, we are having at that moment a mental event. And we have to try to figure out from that mental event what the word is meaning and doing for us. So for example, the Buddhists have the word chit, chit. And it's like what we talked about last night that pure moment of perception. So I can have a chit, a thought. I can have a thought, but I may not have a word. I may have an experience, but I don't put a word with it yet. And sometimes I'll put a word with it and the You'll have to forgive me, I tell granddaughter stories, you know, this is one of my failings. I was recently with my youngest granddaughter and the, this dog kept pushing against her. We were visiting some friends, they have 12 dogs, so there were a lot of dogs, they were all pushing against her and, and she was about five or six. She said, this dog is very aggressive. You know, and I'm looking at her, how does this little tot get such a big word? And then about five minutes later, she came up to me and she said, what does aggressive mean? <laughs> she used it right. She, had, she could use the word, but she couldn't quite put a, a cognitive meaning with the word yet. She, that takes experience, and, and we all do that. We will use an expression, and we really, truly are not quite sure it's like the current slang expressions it takes you a while. What does it mean to say you're toast? 
you know, it takes a little while to understand that, well, that means you're finished, it's all over, forget it. <laughs> but it takes you a while to hear the word in its context and to finally understand it. Even though somehow you know the way people say it, you get a feeling that it means something is not too good or something isn't working, even though you're not quite yet sure. So we get chits, we get, we get a thought, we get an impression. A chaita is we take that and we make a full sentence out of it. The chaita, which follows a chit, that's when we, we speak in language. That's when the words flow out of us. When we get into a cognition and we're thinking and we're saying full sentences, and it's in those full sentences that the words begin to take on their meanings for that moment. Doesn't say that that word will always mean that. We have to remember that. But in that moment, we've given it its meaning. So the Buddhists were always struggling with the fact that we, we get information from the outside, we get a thought, and then we put it into words. And, and in many ways, uh, people have thought in the past that only humans had language. That that's, that's a uniqueness for us. Um, now, I've been reading a book about what the robins are saying. And this book teaches you, if you listen to the robins, he figured out exactly what they're saying. And it, it works to a large degree. Some, some sounds just mean I'm here. Just let you know I'm here. The next sound is there's a dog. They make a particular sound when there's a dog. And you can hear that it's a dog as opposed to it's a person that might be dangerous. <laughs> they did differentiate between dogs and cats. It's amazing. It's a wonderful book. I don't know, is that language? These calls, it's communication. Is communication the, what words are intended to do is to communicate. Um, we know that there are click languages. That is languages that instead of using our normal sounds, they make a click, and those clicks are meaningful. So sound is what we conventionally make it out to be. When we have a mental state, then the question is, where is language with the mental state? Can you have a mental state where you have no words at all? If you have no words, do we have consciousness? Is what do we define as consciousness? Do we have to have words where we put it into words and explain it to ourselves? Do we really have to think the words, I see a tree, before we feel that we have the consciousness of seeing a tree? Does our brain have to tell us, I see a tree? And even if we don't say it out loud, is that what's going on in the brain, a kind of underlying language that's come to the fore? Well, keep this chart in mind. We're going to come back to this because it has other things that we need to do. We've talked about human experience. By now, you're getting tired of it. You've seen it many times. It's here are all the ways that the Buddhists express everything. In the earliest days, people thought they just did it with two words, nama and rupa. Nama is name, rupa is form. And everything was explained as being either nama or rupa, a thought or the thing itself. The five skandhas came along. Rupa becomes the first one of the five skandhas but nama now has to be spread out because the mental activity of naming something 
they began to recognize was a very complex part of human experience. To name something is really a big deal. Naming is, is when you actually have put it all through your process and you've come out with an identity and now you've got to put an identifying mark or characteristic. The 18 Datu is another way for human experience, or the 75, the 81, or the 100 dharmas, where chit is part of those mental states called dharmas. All of these are just different ways of talking about human experience. So let's think about chit. Chit is just a moment of thought. Just, just a thought. And yet, it has, all these moments have been identified and broken down by the meditators. So a thought is, or the chit is, is hearing. We hear a sound, and that creates a mental event, which is a chit. We smell, we taste, we touch. But we also have the fact that we have a chit because we've been reborn. And therefore, at the moment of rebirth, you get a chit. It has death. Death is thought in Buddhism. Death is, is, is that mental event where it's all cut off but they consider that to be a chit. It itself is the one of these moments. But one of the very interesting things about chit is the second one, bhavanga. If everything is momentary, click language, everything is momentary, Everything is, is happening like strobe lights. And that it's like the pearl necklace. Nothing's connecting. It's just the pearls. Each moment, each chit is happening, separated from all the others. Then how do you have continuity? Why is there any continuity between separated things that don't even touch one another. When you have one chit, one mental event, it is an event, and an event means something has a starting point and an ending point. And a chit is a nanosecond. It starts, and before you can even think, it's gone. The event has ended. Then another chit comes, and it's gone and another comes. How are these linked? Our brain somehow is stitching them all together. And so if I'm here, I have uh, this bottle. If I move this bottle across in front of you, each one of those moments is a chit, but it looks like it's continuous, right? You don't see that it's multiple chits happening in your brain. It seems like it's the same bottle. It's, it's continuous. I don't, the bottle does not disappear from your vision as far as you're concerned, right? It's always there. We don't disappear from our vision. But from one perspective, in terms of what they're talking about with the word chit, we do disappear every moment because the chit, which is the mental event of thinking and feeling and having the sensory expression, it's momentary. And then there's another momentary, and there's another momentary. So from one perspective, we are just this from one angle, it looks like unrelated, unconnected string of pearls with no cord through it. 
it's just bouncing like this. It's Bhavanga, and Bhavanga is one of the major terms in Buddhism which I think has to be understood. Bhavanga starts out with the expression, when a man is in deep sleep where there are no dreams, this they call Bhavanga, because all the sensory centorium is cut off. There's no hearing, there's no tasting, there's no sight, there's no feeling. Then how in the world, what happens when the person wakes up? What's the difference between being in that bhavanga, deep sleep, and having a conscious awakening where I'm wide awake? The Buddhists say that there is between two thought processes, between these little chits that are occurring, there is a chitta vitti, there is a connecting link. It is not the chitta itself, but there is something which connects. And they were trying to understand how it is that we can have continuity, or what appears to be continuity, that we live with all the time, and our words are tied to that continuity. So if I say this bottle as a word, it implies a continuity of this thing which I have called a bottle, and it has continuity. It'll, I'm going to say it'll be here at the end of class. The continuity is here. And my experience of it, how in the world do you stitch that together? And the, and it's the chitta that I put up here that is the stitching. We could, the same between two existences. One chit, another chit, another chit, another chit. One moment of exist, that of consciousness, another moment, another experience. But there's a space in between. What happens in that in-between space? That for the Buddhists became crucial to understanding language which was tied to continuousness. They said it like this. The impact of an object on the eye causes the best word I can find is unconscious, the unconscious, in this case, bhavanga, to vibrate. But when the second moment of perception of the eye organ object occurs, bhavanga stops. So basically, if, if think about it a little bit, it says, I have, a, I have a moment, chit. I see you. When that light that bounces off of you gets to my mind, it causes a vibration. At the moment that that vibration starts, the chit is already gone, but the vibration is now carried on by the bhavanga. That is, it's almost like there is this underpinning of us that is vibrating now. But the minute that I think I see you, that stops, not needed. The minute I stop thinking that's you, the babanga starts vibrating again. And so it's the vibrations of the babanga 
that they say tie together all of the chits. I know this may be a little, little difficult, and I don't mean it to be, but it's basically saying this. You got these discrete things that don't touch each other. When, when you have a thought moment, it says that the bavanga stops vibrating. But the minute the chit event ends, it starts vibrating. And it is the second moment occurs when the vibrating babanga is stopping and starting depending on whether there's a chit. It's a very complicated theory, but it is the major idea that the Buddhists have developed in terms of trying to describe continuity. And this is from the Nikayas onward. They were using this idea. So if you think about the sleeping man that they have, they use gender, could be a woman, the sleeper. When the person is asleep, there is just uh, babanga. And it's like a state of nothing is really happening, but somehow it's there. And when the person wakes up, at the moment of awakening, the babanga starts to vibrate. That vibration uh, is causing the unconscious or this babanga to carry on between the chips. So at, at one level it totally disappears and then when the chips turned off it comes back and starts vibrating again and then the chip comes and it's turning on and off, on and off. It's it's something that needs to be explored in terms of whether or not we can understand it better through physics. That is, the string theory of physics is, is somewhat like this. That everything basically is a vibration. And that vibration is happening but it's not always vibrating. I'm not saying it's the same, but it's a way of trying to understand that the whole of whatever anything is vibrates. When it vibrates, something appears or disappears. So it's like I, the light switch back here. I turn on the light switch, the lights go on. They vibrate. When I turn it off, what happens to the light bulb? It starts, vi it stops vibrating. <coughs> it's just in a suspended state. I turn back on the switch, it's vibrating again. I turn it off, I'm turning it on. So it's as if you're standing at the switch, and this is human experience, and it flicks on and flicks off, and it happens so fast, we don't experience it. And it seems continuous. It's a remarkable theory in a lot of ways. It's a remarkable theory. Um, whether it will stand the test of time is another issue. But it's a remarkable theory to say that there is a kind of emptiness which can vibrate. 
And when it begins to vibrate, whether or not we have a chit determines. I talked to you about the, the other thing. I talked to you about um, the fact that instead of vibrations, when we look at an opal, we're seeing light reflection. There is no chemical compound which exists. The color is merely the bent light ray. That's all it is. So that's very close to bhavanga and chit. Chit is like the light that shines on an opal. When chit is on the light is on the opal, it shows color. When you turn off the light, an opal goes completely blank. It has no color whatever. Turn back on the light, and it's showing color. There's no color in the opal. The only thing that is continuous through it is the structure of the opal, I suppose you could say. The structure of the opal, which is silica, has its reflective surface, and that's there. But the color is discontinuous. The color is not continuous. The color depends on the contact of light with those reflective surfaces. The light isn't there, the color is gone. The light comes, the color comes back. Where was the color? Nowhere. The color, when we say, goes away, it doesn't do anything. There was no color. So the Sanskrit word for the opal is upala, which, interestingly enough, comes through Indo-European down to us. Sanskrit is probably the closer closest thing we have to the word for opal it was well known to the Indians. Interestingly, they, they knew it because opals are not found everywhere in the world, but they had, they had a word for it. Take peacock feather. The peacock feather is black. It has only black. The color we see, and the beautiful color in a peacock feather, is the reflected light that strikes the surface of that feather. There is no color in the peacock feather. So when we say there's continuity of color in a peacock feather, it, it's always going to show us this color when light hits it. There is going to be a kind of continuity of the color, but why is there a continuity? It's not because color itself exists through the whole time. The color only exists when there's light. The light goes off, the peacock is black. The light comes on, it's this beautiful color. The color doesn't disappear doesn't go someplace else, it doesn't hide, it never was there. Because the light which reflects from the feather only becomes color when it hits the cone of our eye. That cone transfers it into what we experience as color. <clears throat> Just trying to give you some examples of how you can have continuity which comes and goes according to whether or not you have something else present, like a switch. And that's where the continuity of thought, continuity of what words mean, a word that I, when I have a thought, then my thought goes away. What happens to the word? It's like the color in the, in the peacock feather, where it doesn't go anywhere. Because I'm not thinking, I haven't turned on my light, the word is gone. 
it's it's not there, but it never was there. It's not stored someplace because there was it was never something that I could store. Thoughts are not stored because, in one sense, there's no place to put them. So emptiness in words is the old four alternatives. You can say something is, or it not is, or it both is and not is, or it neither is nor not is. So which is it with the color of a peacock feather? From one, one, one experience, it is. I see it. I see color. I turn off the light, the color is not. So which is it? Is it both that it exists and doesn't exist? Because on the one hand, I see it. The other hand, I don't. Or is it that it neither is not, nor not not? The four alternatives simply don't give us a, an essential nature of anything. Because everything that we, we see has to have something else to bring it about. The peacock feather color has to have light. It doesn't do it by itself. I don't care what the peacock does, it can't make that color. It's always black. It needs the other thing to put with it. It's like we started talking about the word Washington. Nothing until you put another, until it gets a partner. We don't have any meaning until we get a partner. In this case, we don't have any existence until we get a partner. And when the partnership ends, it's over. But what the partnership produced was never there. It was something which Spark needed our icons to produce. In other words, the same for words. What is it that makes a word meaningful to us is it has to go into our brain and be processed into a cognitive thing. That sound has to, has to do that. So the question is, words are names. So, for example, they found a new lichen, as is often the case. Somebody who finds a new thing, they name it for somebody. So. President Obama now has a lichen named for him. Uh, that's, that's the way we, we make up names. We all agree that from now on, this lichen will be called by the Latin name, Caloplaca Obamae. <laughs> that's what it's going to be. We've all agreed that's the convention. That's how we name things in, in the world of botany. So, but the question is, is this really what it says it is, its name? The lichen, in one sense, has nothing whatever to do with President Obama. It is a projection. It is just a convention that we have followed. And, and yet, it has very specific meaning. It means this particular plant and no other. So our convention can be very specific. And we need some of that. If we don't have some conventional idea about what a word means, we're in deep trouble. Because I'm going to start talking, and I may use the word aggressive. And if you don't know what it means, we're in trouble because we can't communicate. We have to have, communication says, we have to have two partners who understand or agree upon the same thing. 
Otherwise, there's no communication. So communication comes and goes according to whether or not I found somebody who knows this word. You know, many years ago, they found uh, the last of a tribe of Indians, Ishi, in Northern California, and they brought him to the Berkeley campus, and they had him live there in the Department of Anthropology for the last years of his life. And Ishi was the last person from his tribe. There was nobody who spoke his language, so that he had, when they found him, he was found at a slaughterhouse up in Northern California trying to get some meat. He was starving. He, he had no support base, and he had no communication. He had lost all communication because his language was only spoken by him. <laughs> Imagine what it would be if you found yourself in a world where the only person on, who understood you was yourself. You got nobody to talk to. So consequently, you have no communication. You've got to somehow try to find somebody and say, let's see if we can't somehow communicate enough that, you know, this is water, water. <laughs> and then you say, okay, if they say water, yes, yes, this is water. Slowly build up communication because otherwise it's a very fearful state. He was in despair. And for the rest of his life, he never found anybody, even though the linguists tried to, and they did, they tried to get as much of his language as they could to preserve it and the words, but nobody sp spoke it in a natural way. So communication was lost because there was no partner in the communication any longer. Religion and language has been a very big thing. Naming is dangerous. That's why in, in many of the Abrahamic religions, they never use the word for God. Judaism never says the word for God. They say a, a synonym. <coughs> because if you can say the name of somebody, you have great power. I don't know if you remember the children's story about Rumpelstiltskin. Rumpelstiltskin came into the life of a young woman. She had her father had convinced the king to let her marry the king's son because she could weave straw into gold. The king said, aha, we have solved our budget problem. He must marry this girl, and then as soon as they're married, I'm going to put her in a room with a lot of straw, and she's going to spin that straw into gold, and we're rich. Well, of course, she couldn't do it. So this poor gir young girl, there she is. She's married to the prince. She likes the prince very much, but she's got to weave the straw into gold, and she can't do it. So into her life comes this little wizened gnome who says, you're trying to weave straw into gold, and you don't know how to do it, do you? She says, no, I don't, and they're going to probably kill me because I've lied, and everybody's lied. He said, sorry, right, I'll do it for you. However, if I weave the straw, you must give me your firstborn child. I need somebody to take care of me. So I want your baby. And she said, well, that's really a hard thing to do. And he said, is there no alternative? He said, well, there is one. If you tell me what my name is, I won't do it. I won't make you give me your child. Well, of course, she doesn't know what his name is, and so she can't deal with it. But as he comes, he weaves every night, he weaves 
straw into gold. He can do it. So every morning, the king is very happy, the prince is very happy. My gosh, here it is, more gold. And yet, when the first child comes, then the terror. He comes back and he says, all right, I, I wove for you. You promised me your firstborn. I want this baby. She's horrified. I can't give you my child. Promise is a promise. So she sends people out to try to find out his name. And fortunately, one man happens to see him dancing in the woods saying, my name is Rumpelstiltskin and nobody knows it that I'm going to get her baby. He rushes back to the prince and says, his name is Rumpelstiltskin. And when she can say his name, she has power over him. And he has to stalk off angry and alone in the world because she knows his name. Naming is very important in religion. That's why in lots of cultures, only the mother and the child know the real name of the person. Only you and your mother know your name. You mustn't let anybody else know it. If they know your name, they got power over you. That's why very often when we talk like people with saying the word for God, you'd have power over God if you could say his name. It's very common in lore and in religion. So of course we in the academic world, we have all sorts of ways to deal with words. <laughs> we have a text, it's made up of words. And then we have all these ways in which we study and we try to understand those words and sometimes it works. And sometimes we just don't know what it means. Is it the heart sutra? Is it the heart that's pumping in my body? Or is it my broken heart? Which one? Which, which does it mean of all the meanings? So that, therefore, if something has a range of meanings, depending on the situation, then the word itself is meaningless. So somebody has said, we ought to have an undictionary. Instead of a dictionary, we ought to have the undictionary which said, this is what the word does not mean. <laughs> of course, you, there's no end to what it doesn't mean. <laughs> That's why the, the Buddhist with this continuity is that there is an appearance of selfhood because all the causes and conditions appear to have a pattern which gives the impression of an identity just like the chit and the babanga give the impression of continuity. And therefore, people come up with the idea of a self that is permanent and continuous. Like we look out across the ocean, and each of those waves we see as something that is real. And, and yet, each of them is rising and falling. And was it ever there? What was there? Was there such a thing as a wave? It was just the water. How did we make it a wave? So for the Buddhists, they're trying to say it is the emptiness of selfhood. That is, we try to identify ourself and we use a name for ourself and we use a word because when we say my name, Lu, it says that implies that I exist and I am a real person. A grandfather story. <laughs> One of my granddaughters, I realized she didn't know what my name is. She thought my name was Grandpa. And I finally had to say to her, you know, my name isn't Grandpa. My name is Lou. So she thought for a minute, and she said, hiya, Lou. <laughs> she got it. All right, that's your name. <laughs> she suddenly had power over me because she knew my name. <laughs> It's, it's the, it is continuity which words imply. And we think our language is talking about a continuous thing. We are having always to understand that the words often cover up the true nature. They are like a mask. They are show us like a mask and we think, aha, that's Clark Kent. <laughs> I know him, he's a reporter. Well, of course, it's just a disguise. It's just an appearance. 
and words are like that. They, they give us, and we think we're naming somebody. So if I said, Don is sitting here in front of me, I'm giving him a reality by calling him by his name, by identifying him from all other persons in this very moment. I'm using words and a word as if there is a continuous thing called Don. And he's here today, he's here tomorrow, he was here yesterday. It looks continuous. You really look there, like you're there. So we're struggling always with the fact that we interpret our words, we give explanations in them, and we think that everything is repeats. So if I use the word now, I assume it's the same, I'm going around in a circle. I say Don. The next minute I say Don. The next minute I say Don. But in fact, it's more like a spiral. Every time I've used his name, he's changed. He changed in just those moments. So I'm using the word, but it's a different thing. I'm using the same word. I'm going up the spiral. Every time I use it, the whole thing has changed. So in the, in the biblical term, um, in something which I've never quite understand, uh, the Tower of Babel, God decides in that text that if everybody had one language, they would be too powerful and they would have nothing that would restrain them. So therefore, in order to confound them, he had to create multiple languages. It's punishment that we have different languages. And I feel that every time I have had to take a foreign language and learn it, it's punishment, I know. <laughs> God is punishing me for trying to undo the Tower of Babel. But it's an interesting idea that, that language can be seen as dangerous. That communication can be seen as dangerous. But we know that culture and language is a shared convention, just like rituals and cultural events are shared. We also know that there's deep structure. That is, language has many levels of meaning, like Chomsky says. And you see a ball like this, which is a ball within a ball within a ball within a ball. And in many ways, that's the way what we live with our words. They are words within words within within context, within context, and we keep going to deeper and deeper levels with them. But we have to have language in our human communication within the context of society. And if we see something which is unusual, we have to give it a name. If we can't name it, we don't know what we're dealing with. To have something that's unnamed is really a serious issue for us. So that's why in the linguistic analysis, chitta is separated from any idea of meaning because it's continuous, it's momentary, it, it keeps having multiple moments, and so we are left always struggling to find out how can we use our language. So when the Buddhists say, you could use a word. Just to understand that unless it's, it's tied to something else, it doesn't have any meaning usually in and of itself. It's got multiple meanings. It's meaningless. You, we use it, convention, communication. It works at one level. But all we have to do is take that same word and put it in another sentence, in another place. It has a completely different meaning. So when the Buddhists say, it's mere words, when they say, it's just, you're just using a conventional expression, it's not the thing itself. I can speak of nirvana till I'm blue in the face, but it doesn't mean that I have nirvana. It's my word 
for something which I really don't know what it would be like. I've never experienced nirvana. So I use it. And that's in scholarship what we're doing all the time. We're using words. We don't really know always the exact meaning of them. So when we look at words, they have an emptiness. And that emptiness says that we've not yet found something which has permanence. We've not found just because I can name you, you're not permanent. My name for you is just a convention. And my naming is like the spiral. Every time I name you, you're somebody different. So thank you. Sorry, it went over a bit. So carried away. Too many stories. <laughs> questions or you have any questions? Okay, good. Yeah. Wait a minute, we'll get the mic. Well, I'm not exactly sure how to say this, but can you speak into the mic? Um, there's <clears throat> Chitta, which at the same time I'm assuming there's neurons and chemical reactions and everything's going off instantly. Yes. And then all that stops in the Bhagavan. When, when we, the minute we have a, a chit, almost immediate, and in every case basically, unless you're very skilled at meditation, it's followed by naming. I look out here and I get a chit. I get the impression as soon as I have chit, the next moment I think, I see this class. That's Chaitasika. I've taken the chit now and I've put words to it. I've made words up. The Buddhists are just reminding us that the words I make up to describe what that chit is are just conventional expressions. They don't really mean you. If I say you, is that you? I said, no, that's me. <laughs> the words that we use are, in that sense, have no meaning. Part of the reason why there's no meaning is because we, we try to use words to put on something that looks continuous. But the experience of things is this chitta babanga switching on and off, so there is no con continuity, basically, but I use the words as if the, it was. So I refer to myself every time I do an email and I put, see you soon, Lou. I'm using that as if that's the same person that started typing this email. Well, in the Bhagamga part, Yes. Is there consciousness there? No. That was my question. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, I meant that's part of it. No, that, that's, that's why Babanga is said deep sleep is the metaphor. It's, it's, it comes on and off. The minute there is consciousness, Babanga goes away. When consciousness isn't there, the only thing that's still existing is is that there are problems with the theory, but it's it's nevertheless something which was developed, and still used. Um, um, when when you use the example cheat and the banga, you're using the, the light, right? So I am assuming that you can extend this to uh, smell, yes. sound, and well, consciousness. So in this case, are we saying that you know all our uh, senses are in this turning off and turning yes right on? Just a clarification. Yeah, a chip it would have been when I showed you the sixteen or fourteen different chits. One of them is smell, taste. Those are considered to be these moments. I have a smell. That's a chit. 
the minute I say, oh, I smell cinnamon buns, that's a chaitasika. I've already named it. I'm talking about it now as if it was a continuous, real thing that you understand what cinnamon bun is, so we are communicating. I'm, I'm using all of those. But from the point of view of the chit, the smell comes and then it goes away, and then it comes back and goes away because it's coming to me each, each moment. The moment cannot be extended. The event is momentary. So consequently, you can't say, hey, I was smelling cinnamon buns for five, five minutes. No, each smell is a momentary, and a momentary, and a momentary. And yet I stitch it all together and it looks like I'm continually smelling the same thing, but I'm not. Each time I have a chit, the smell and everything that I'm smelling has changed. The cinnamon bun has begun to cool, so it's not quite as vigorous as it was when I first had the chip. But in this case, does it mean that, uh, does it assume that we have something that, you know, store our uh, moment between moments? Otherwise, how, the next moment, how do you continue? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, of course, was why I think they developed the consciousness theory of, so that it included storage, like the alaya vijnana, that they thought that bhavanga, to some degree, somehow memory has to be there. But the, what they were trying to say is, just like the color of the peacock feather, you can have memory, but it comes and goes too. It's, it is just as ephemeral as the color from the peacock. And the memory is only there when certain circumstances are happening. And if those circumstances are not there, there's no memory. Where does the memory go? They use the metaphor of a storehouse consciousness. A storehouse, a treasure house. They, they use these terms. Lots of Buddhists did not follow that direction. They said that's a little too much like permanence. And they didn't like it. But from, a, from when you really read what they were saying, they weren't really saying that it was permanent. They were saying, when you have certain conditions, that memory will arise. Those conditions go away, that memory is gone, but where did it, where did it come from? It was only something which could be created under those particular circumstances for that moment. Then the big question is, where's the mystery? Then why, why would those conditions produce such a thing? And that's why the Buddhists say that you get the right conditions, you'll get, a, you'll get it. You put them together, and that's what happens. You put them back together, that's what happens. But it's momentary, and it's gone. So the memory I pull up from my alaya, it's gone in the next moment. It arises again because the condition is there. Then it's gone again. And that's why this on and off switch <laughs> was why, one of the ways in which the Buddha said, you have to know the switch goes off. And when it goes off, the, the light is gone. It's not there. And when it comes on, it's there. But what's there is what is created by those particular circumstances for that little moment. And that's what we live with. <laughs>